Today's class is a 10 minute university presentation offered in collaboration with and in support of the OSU Extension Service Master Gardener Program. At our website, you will find handouts, videos, upcoming classes and workshops. Our program is a volunteer led and we are supported by OSU faculty to ensure the quality of our content. So let's begin talking about growing early season vegetables. First of all, I want you to know that we have lots of 10 minute university handouts that have to do with growing vegetables and you can find all of those on our website. And OSU Extension also has many wonderful publications pertaining to vegetable growing. A lot of them have to do with early season vegetables and other types of season vegetables also. So the objectives for part one of today's webinar are to learn which vegetables are considered early season vegetables, find out why we grow early season vegetables, know when to plant these vegetables, and decide if you need to put in seeds or transplants into the ground, and learn a little bit about season extenders. So what do we mean by early season planting? We're talking about vegetables that are planted in early to mid spring. These are vegetables that can withstand some cold weather and some cold soil. They are also the vegetables that do not like being grown in very warm, hot weather. We consider those early season vegetables are called cool season. So we have cool season and we have warm season plants. So today we're gonna to be talking about the cool season plant. Now, why plant an early season vegetable? Well, obviously it's obvious that cool season crops grow best in cool weather. There is a less chance of bolting, in other words, going to seed when these types of vegetables are planted in the cooler weather. You have less pest problems because the insects haven't really come out yet. It hasn't warmed up enough for them to come out yet. And you need less watering. Here in the Willamette Valley, we do get a lot of rain in the springtime, so we're not needing to be out there watering our gardens. And also, you will increase the production in your garden. So you're not just planting during the hot summer season, but you can extend the garden, garden season by starting in early spring. Now, I'm sure you want to know, well, what can I grow? Well, you can grow plant vegetables in the brassicas, the broccoli family. That includes broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, kale, kohlrabi. Root vegetables are also considered early season vegetables. That would include your beets, your carrots, potatoes, garlic, leeks, onions, and radishes. And a lot of leafy green vegetables are considered our early season vegetables. And that would also include lettuce, green onions, Swiss chard, bok choy, mustard, spinach, arugula. A lot of greens grow well in the cooler weather. Now, before you plant, you need to be sure that your soil is dry enough. Cultivating when the soil is too wet will break down the soil structure. So you can determine if your soil is ready to plant by taking the squeeze test. So what you do is you pick up some soil in your hand and squeeze it like the photo on the left. And then take your other hand and take a finger and push on that. If it stays all squished together in a ball, you will know that your ground is too wet and you definitely don't wanna get out there and cultivate or get ready to plant anything. But if you take a scoop of soil in your hand and squeeze it tight, you open your hand up, take your other finger and your other hand, push on it and it falls apart, you will know that your soil is dry enough to plant. And that way you can get out there and work the soil and get ready for planting. But if your soil is dry enough to plant, you still need to be sure that the soil temperature is warm enough for your seeds to germinate or for the roots to grow. So the soil temperature must be warm enough for the seeds to germinate. And I will tell you, and we'll talk about that next too, is each seed types of seed takes different types of temperature, different temperatures in order to germinate. You can use what is called a soil thermometer. You can get those in most any nursery or farm store. What you would do is you'd push the thermometer about four to five inches in the ground. You want it far enough in the ground to where it will be around where your roots are going to be growing. Then you want to leave it on for five minutes 
and actually longer is better. The longer it stays in, probably the better the temperature is going to uh, be the exact temperature that you need to, to look at. You wanna take the temperature for several days in a row and morning is usually the coolest time of day. So it's good to take it in the morning. And that way you can kind of figure out the average of when, what the, your soil temperature is at that time. Now, there are many publications that have soil temperature charts. This chart is from the OSU publication called Vegetable Gardening in Oregon. And you will notice that it lists the minimum temperature range for each crop and also the optimum range for that crop to germinate. Now, by looking at the soil temperature chart, such as this one, and taking your soil temperature, you can be sure that the crops that you want to plant will be able to grow really well. Now you will notice here, if you look at carrot, it says the minimum soil temperature for carrot is 40, cauliflower is 40, Swiss charges for 40. And then if you go down farther, you'll be able to tell which of these plants are cool season crops and which of them are warm season crops. If you look at oh, your pepper and your pumpkin and your squash, they all need a soil temperature of 60 degrees in order to germinate or in order for the roots to grow. So it's a very good idea to have a, one of these soil temperature charts before you get, get ready to plant your early season vegetables. You can also use a planting chart, not just a temperature chart, but a planting chart. And the planting chart, such as this one, will tell you the optimum dates for planting certain vegetables in your area. Now, of course, this may vary from year to year, depending on the weather and also depending on your soil condition. And once again, this chart is also from the OSU publication, Growing Vegetables in Oregon. It has planting dates for the different regions in Oregon, not just for the Willamette Valley. Plus, if you'll notice on this, it will also tell you when to start your seeds indoors. If, if your vegetable is a type of seed that can be, that you want to plant and not buy at a nursery, that still will tell you when, what date to plant it indoors so that it will be ready to plant outdoors at the correct time. And don't forget seed catalogs. Even if you're not going to order from them, they have a lot of good information about growing different crops. Not only that, but if you look online at the seed catalogs online, you will even see customer reviews. And that can tell you a lot about what a certain crop is going to be like. You will notice this cauliflower in the middle of the slide. And this information underneath the cauliflower was information that came from the Territorial Seed Catalog. Now, Territorial and Johnny's are two very good seed catalogs, but there are a lot of other, a lot of other types of seed catalogs out there that can give you some really good information. So you'll, if you read down through this, you'll see about how long it takes this cauliflower to grow. It talks about how big it's going to be, how much it's going to weigh. It also talks about what's going to happen when it starts to mature, when it, the summertime temperatures get hotter. So it gives you a lot of ideas about the crop that you're going to be planting. Now, your seed packets will also give you lots of good information. This seed packet here tells about the seed depth, the seed spacing, the soil temperature that's best for germination. See, it even tells you that, not only of those charts, but you can find that information on your seed packets too. Um, it also tells you how many days it should take for it to germinate. So if it says it takes, say, six to 21 days to germinate, I know that's kind of a long span, this is carrots, and sometimes carrots can be a little fickle, but if you're all of a sudden you're in four weeks and it hasn't germinated yet, you'll know that maybe something isn't quite right and you might need to replant. It also tells you how best to sow the seeds along with fertilization, fertilization tips and even some insect prevention tips. This seed packet talks about the carrot fly maggots that may be a problem and it tells you a little bit about how to control that, how to make sure that you aren't going to have those problems with your seeds and with your plants. Now, before you plant your crops, you will need to know if it will grow best from seeds planted directly into the ground or if it's going to be need, needed to be put in as a plant, which we call transplants. 
Now, transplants can either be grown by you in your a nice sunny window or in your greenhouse, or you can purchase them in a nursery or a farm store. The publications and the seed catalogs and the seed packets that I mentioned will give you the information that you need to decide the best way to grow your crop. In other words, it will tell you whether it grows best from seed or whether it needs to be put in the ground for a plant. And here's some information on this slide. For seeds, Carrots, peas, lettuce, kohlrabi, greens, beets, and radishes do best when they're planted directly into the soil from seeds. Cabbage, broccoli, and cauliflower, they will not do well. If you try to put just the seeds in the ground, they have they take a longer time to get reach maturity and they only like the cooler weather, of course. So they need to be put into the ground as a plant and not as a seed. Now, kale, kohlrabi, and lettuce, those are some of the crops that can be either put seeded in the ground or you can grow them out or purchase them and then they can put in, be put in the ground as plants also. And then of course we have potatoes and onions. Potatoes, you will be putting it in, it's called a potato tuber. You will be purchasing a disease-free potato from a nursery or a farm store and putting those into the ground. And onions, sometimes they're called onion sets. Sometimes you'll be hear them called onion starts. So those that will be planted in the ground. Now, if you have a large seed like a pea seed or beet seeds or radishes seeds, you might want to soak them overnight. This will loosen the outside shell of the seed and make germination just a little bit faster. Okay, now you've probably heard the word season extenders and so my co-host, and I are going to talk about this a little bit more later, but I thought I would just give you a little bit of heads up about what season extenders are. Season extenders are any method that allows a crop to be grown beyond its normal outdoor growing season. Some season extenders would include raised beds, cold frames, high tunnels, black plastic mulch, row covers, and cloches. They will either, these, these uh, season extenders will either warm the soil or they will warm the air around the plants, or they will do both. And this helps to create a nice little microclimate for the plants to grow in. Because if it is too cold outside, even if your soil is ready and the temperature in your soil, you might have some cold days, you might have some cold nights, and you might need to protect your plants from the weather. So that's what season extenders are going to be used for. So raised beds. The soil in raised beds warm up quicker than the soil in the ground. So those of you that have raised beds, you're going to be able to get your plants in the ground sooner than those of us that are growing our plants straight into the ground. Raised beds do allow for earlier planting because of that. Now, there are many different types of frames that you can use to go around your raised beds, or you don't even have to have a frame, just a mound that you're planning into is also considered a raised bed. Cold frames are an item that extends the growing season also. Sometimes they are used for starting seeds. They usually, when people use them as a seed starting, as a cold frame at first seed starting, they would usually have a bottom on, on the cold frame and then they would put a propagation mat, a heated propagation mat, and then that's where they would put their seeds. But sometimes people use them without a bottom on them and they put them directly over the seeds or over the plants. And as you can see from the photo on the right, they also have, they also lift up. So if it gets too hot during the day, you can lift it up and let more air circulation and then let some of that hot air out so that you don't burn up the plants. The covering is usually either greenhouse plastic or sometimes hard plastic, something like that. People even make them out of glass. There's a lot of different ways to make and build cold frames. Now, floating row cover is also known, some people just call it garden fabric. It is usually a white, thin, light piece of material and is typically made from either polypropylene or polyester. It does not absorb moisture, but it does allow rainfall and sunlight to pass through it. So the floating row covers will warm the soil and the air. 
you can either lay them over your plants as that photo on the left shows. What you would do is like, if you had a broccoli or cabbage plant, you'd lay it over it, leave a little bit of space in there so that the plant grows, it can lift up the, the row cover. And you would have to, of course, secure it on the edges. You can also attach it to frames or hoops, such as the picture that you see on the right. And the nice thing about this material is, as long as you take care of it, it can be used for several years in a row. It's not something that you just have to use and then have to throw away. Now, a cloche is usually, is considered a small a translucent cover for protecting outdoor plants. Cloche is a French word meaning bell. And we use cloches to cover the plants that need protection from the elements, but it's usually only large enough to cover one plant at a time. You can either buy cloches like that bell one that you see there in the picture on the left, or you can make your own. That other photo shows ice cream jugs, excuse me, milk jugs that have been cut off on the bottom and set over the plants to give them a little bit more protection from the weather. Now, I know I have gone through this presentation fairly quickly, even faster than I expected to, but my co-host will join me now and we have some more questions for you and some more answers. So Priscilla and Sherry, are you there? Yes, we are. Thank you, Jane, for kicking off okay. this discussion. And um, let's talk a little bit about weather effects and how can the gardeners deal with it? Up until now, we're seeing a very wet and cold spring, and we had a similar experience last year. In fact, spring seemed to never end until I think June or July last year. Mm -hmm. So under these conditions, how might a gardener think about growing early season vegetables? What should we do in order to still be successful? Well, you know, as we said earlier, Jane uh, showed the pictures of the various types of row covers, and you can buy specific types of row covers, different weights for your needs. For example, if you really want to protect against frost, you want to get a heavier one, which is like 1.2 ounces, and that actually protects when covering the plant and properly installed, it will protect the plant down to 24 degrees. So that's a really great way to protect, especially when we have a snow shower like this morning, um, we wanna protect them. Um, but on the long-term, what we, I, we have done over at Grow an Extra Row where we produce vegetables um, for food banks, we actually in the fall cover our our beds with a very heavy six mil black plastic. And that plastic goes down at the end of our growing season, which is about November 1st. And what that plastic does is it actually protects the bed um, from extra rain water, which could actually compact it. Um, and then as, um, and it, it actually helps keeps the minerals in the soil instead of leaching them away in the rains. And then lastly, in the spring, we are able to grow earlier because of that black plastic. Now, clear plastic is also an option, um, but you're not going to have the weed suppression that you get with a black plastic. So both of those are options for helping to extend the season. Um, just a little bit more about applying those, um, a row cover, this is a um, 0.55 row cover, and you can see that it, you can see through it a little bit, but um, this is a lighter weight and protects against 28 degrees um, and keeps the warmth in there. It can be applied flat as a floating row cover or in a hoop. When you apply it on a hoop, you can use a small little clip like this, just a little document clip and put them around and it will secure them. And um, let's see, I think that's for the extending the seasons right now. Um, anything else that you wanted to cover on that, Sherry? Well, it sounds like the plastic covering keeping the soil dry also helps it warm up faster 
and that should support better seed germination because Jane earlier was showing the table of soil temperature that's required for seed germination. Are there other uh, tricks or tips that you would like to offer people about um, how to plant seeds during these cold, miserable, wet uh, conditions and that would encourage better seed germination? Jane, you want to take that one? Um, well, one way is that I did mention you soaking the larger seeds to, to soften the seed coat on the outside will help with germination. Some people will even germinate their seeds inside by putting them between wet paper towels and maybe setting them on top of the refrigerator or someplace where it's warm. And as soon as you see the little root begin, just start out of the seed, then you can plant them in the garden. So that helps. But all of the season extenders, like Priscilla talked about, the black covering, just making sure that the soil is warm and dry enough and is ready to work will help with the seed germination. Anything to add, Priscilla? Oh, well, you know, if you've got your hoops, whether it is a, um, a galvanized wire conduit or just the nine gauge plastic, you can also apply a, this is called tool, T-U-L-L-E, and it's a fabric that people may be familiar with, sort of like a bridal veil. This is a very fine tool, and we use this um, to protect our crops from perhaps uh, some hail or, but it, but it really works well to keep them protected from pests. So when you've got those early plants growing, you don't have insects. You can keep out the flea beetles. These actually help to prevent that. And um, if you're using the conduit or a PVC pipe, you might use a clip like this and it just clips right on over and you would put the fabric and just clip it right over like that. And you wanna take it all the way down to the ground. Um, if you're in a raised bed, you can use the sides of the raised beds to support those uh, pipes. But if you're just in the ground, you can still do it, but put a little bit of rebar. And then I have my mallet for uh, hammering in rebar so that you can get those sturdy into the ground. The last thing for securing, whether it be the black plastic or the row cover or the tool is you want to have your ground staples. And these can be used year to year. They start to look a little rusty and grungy, but as long as I can get them in, um, they just go on the edge of the fabric and just go straight down into the ground so that this staple is level with the soil. So that's gonna help you keep your pests out. So that certainly helps with germination when your seeds aren't disappearing from by birds or other, other pests. That sounds great. I'm curious about in your own gardening practices, do you actually use season extenders? I mean, Jane's presentation cover a lot of options available, but we all know it's work to create the structure, move it around, uh, open it up, closing it. And so I'm curious about your personal um, experience and choices for why you do use them or you don't. Uh, let's begin with Jane. I don't think she does. But the only thing I do, I have three different garden beds and they're, they're in ground, they're not raised beds. So every year I rotate what crops I'm gonna plant in those three. So the one section I know is going to be for my early season vegetables. So in the fall, after my late crops are done, I do put black plastic down, just like Priscilla talked about, and, and hook it down to the ground and try to keep that on there all winter long. And then when we have some nice spring weather and I know the sun's coming out, I usually will remove it so it can dry out even a little bit more underneath. So that's what that's how I use season. That's it's the season extender that I use on mine. As far as the row covers and things like that, I normally don't need to use it on my plant, my early season plants, unless the temp, unless the weather forecast is for something drastic, and then I would probably just throw row cover on temporarily. 
and and we should add that you have a greenhouse, so you have additional options in terms of yes. starting seeds and overwintering yes. tender plants. Priscilla, yes. would you talk a little bit about extra rows since it's a different situation, opening a community garden, teams of volunteer go there to work. How do you manage using row cover to help with the crop production? Well, at uh, Grow an Extra Row, we have 30 25 foot, 36 inch wide garden beds. So that is a lot of coverage for plants. And we find that the season extenders not only might be a little labor intensive on the front end, but they help us on the back end in terms of um, keeping our plants healthy and growing and protecting them from all sorts of pests, including bipedal pests, which happen <laughs> at community gardens. You know, if things are undercover, then um, you're less likely to have things disappear because, you know, that's hard. But again, um, we install drip lines and by having those row covers, we're actually helping to retain the moisture. And of course, moisture is very important for germination, growth, and the development of the plant. Um, we have used the tool a lot over at the Grow an Extra Row to help with pests. And remember, when you're using this physical barrier, then you're not having to use um, pesticides or herbicides, you know, to to keep down weeds or, you know, keep away the pests. So um, by using those, you're also growing vegetables that are, are less affected with chemicals. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Yeah, and um, at Grow an Extra Row, oh, we even use small strips of the row cover on our pea fence so that we can protect the peas as they're growing and developing before they get up onto the fence. So, so it doesn't always have to be in a ho hoop. It doesn't always have to be flat as in a floating row cover, but it can also be sort of as like a little teepee against um, fences. So if you're growing something on a fence, think about using row covers to protect that young seedling there. Yeah, definitely row covers are really good uh, flexible materials in helping to create a microclimate, whether you put it over the crop directly to make it warmer. What was the temperature difference, Priscilla, you were saying earlier about putting row cover over um, seedlings, for example, and you can raise the temperature below the row cover by some degree? Yeah, by about seven degrees um, at a minimum. And of course, that's going to be dependent on the solar energy that we're getting and how wet the soil is. Those are both um, variables that are going to change the amount, but it's going to raise by at least seven degrees um, with a row cover, if if not more. It's been um, a while since I bought row cover. I vaguely remember there are different thicknesses. Is yeah. that correct? Yep. So um, I did a bit of research online and you can get um, 0.55 ounce and that's being measured with um, ounces per square yard. So that's just the, um, the thing. And then uh, 0.9 um, and then 1.2, it even goes up to 1.5 and 2.0. I was just doing a little bit more. Now, when you are getting the heavier ones, remember that you're gonna be sacrificing the amount of light that is gonna be getting to your plants. So when you are going heavy duty with that 2.0, you're only getting about 30% of the light coming through. So Great. there has to be a balance there. Yeah. And that row cover comes in various widths. And be sure if you're gonna be putting it over a hoop, think about what that circumference is going to be because some people have come up a little short. Um, and, uh, and, it's, and it's benefits is it allows the air to flow through there. That's very important for good development. It um, allows some light and water to penetrate through as well. Um, for my own personal garden, I have a small raised bed and I do a winter um, hoop house and Three quarters of my hoop house is a um, 
uh, row cover. And then the other one is just a clear plastic so that I can get some actual solar energy going in there. And I've been able to grow kale all winter long, even in the snow. Um, and it, it prevented those crops from getting trampled down. And, uh, and now that hoop house is allowing me to start get my plants in. This is great. So uh, let's wrap up before we move into the next segment talking about dry farming. Perhaps uh, Jane and Priscilla, if you have any other pointers, other tips for growing early season vegetables? Um, one thing I wanted to mention about the early season vegetables, when it gets, when the weather gets warmer, they have a tendency to bolt and go to seed, but there are several things that you can do to prevent that. And that would, there are some bolt resistant seeds available. So if you do have trouble with something going to seed, you might check out and buy a different type the next year. Also, you want to definitely plant your crops when it's cooler and not plant a cool season crop in the middle of summer, but unless you're growing it for a fall crop also. Also, you can put, to save some of the moisture and to cool the plants down, you can put mulch around your plants and that will keep the moisture and it will keep them a little bit cooler. Also make sure, believe it or not, that you're using the appropriate fertilizer. Sometimes fertilizer, over-fertilizing can cause them to bolt. And also direct sowing your seeds if it's possible. Say if you're growing lettuce, you will be able to keep that from bolting more if you're planting it directly into the ground than if you are if you're planting a transplant into the ground. So those are a few things to keep your plants from bolting. Great. And just one more point. Um, when you're talking about soil, it, the spring is really a good time to get your soil tested, especially for pH. And at the Spring Garden Fair, we will be doing soil testing. So that's the first weekend in May and you can bring your soil up there and then we can give you a sheet and um, advise you on how to amend your soil if you need to add some lime. So because plants, it's all science. And if the, the pH is not correct, then no matter what we do, your plant isn't going to be absorbing all the nutrients and growing at a level that will be satisfying as a gardener. Great. Well, let's wrap up this segment. Thank you, Jane and Priscilla. And we'll go into a quick segment on dry farming. And um, after that, we'll have more time for Q&A with everybody. So stay with us, please. All right, let's talk a little bit about dry farming. Dry farming is growing crop with no supplemental irrigation, relying only on moisture that's already in the soil, captured from the rain, and kept there. Dry farming is a practice that is growing under far less than ideal conditions, so you can expect the yield will be much lower. However, taste tests have shown consistently the dry farm produce are considered to have better flavor and more concentrated flavor. This method of farming uses less resources, for example, water, labor, and fertilizer. And you might wonder why would people choose to do that? Well, the fact is in Western Washington, Oregon, and Northern California, there are a number of farms where they have the land but there is no water supply available or the cost of irrigation is simply too high for the revenue that they can uh, gain from growing the crop. So this is a different way of growing. If you're interested in learning more about it, there are a couple of resources available on this page, which will um, allow you to learn more about this. Let's just quickly look at how dry farming works. In the dry system I've mentioned, we rely on the moisture that's already in the soil, while in an irrigated system, of course, we water as needed. In the dry system, we plant when there is soil moisture and it's high enough for the seed to germinate and for the seedling to grow well. In the irrigated system, we plant when the soil temperature is suitable for the seeds to germinate. 
the dry system requires good to excellent soil in order to be productive. And the irrigated system can deal with a range of soil. We simply compensate by, uh, with amendment and other things that we do. The dry system is suitable for some vegetables, not all. And some examples are shown on the screen. So it includes winter squash, zucchini, tomato, and dry beans, just for examples. And as we know, the irrigated system works for a much wider range of vegetables. In order for dry farming to work, it requires a good site, a different kind of soil preparation, specific crop selection, the planting technique and timing is different. And finally, a lot of efforts going into the preservation of soil moisture. So let's begin with the crop selection. Even though dry farming has been the practice for decades on some of the farms, as I mentioned in Western Oregon, Washington and Northern California, the systematic research on this topic at Oregon State University only began in 2016. But today they have generated quite a lot of test results. Uh, essentially, OSU researchers grow these vegetables in what's called field trials. And they record the results and they share that information. So on the top of that page, there is a link which leads you to the research results. Currently, OSU team has a focused effort on dry farming tomatoes and dry farming what they call culinary corn. These are corn grown, um, dried, and then ground into uh, corn meal flour and used for food products. If you don't really want to learn too much about the trial results and what works, but you may be interested in giving dry farming a, um, a try. In the center of this page is a link that takes you to the Dry Farming Institute seed directory. That's where the OSU research the results are um, shown. And um, if you click on the kind of plant or vegetable that you're interested in growing, it will take you to a seed provider. So that's a, a simple way to give it a try and see what happens. So let's begin with site selection. I've mentioned earlier, dry farming requires good soil. Ideally, it has deep soil and the soil has great ability in holding water. And if you're um, if you happen to have a place where there's high water table, like on Salve Island, that's even better. In addition, we want a site where there is a minimum loss of water. And so something like a windbreak to create a microclimate to reduce evaporation will be helpful. And earlier, there were discussions about raised bed that allow you to plant earlier. Well, in dry farming, it's just the opposite. We want to plant in a level bed or even sunken bed because soil in the raised bed will dry out faster. So if we're looking at the nature of soil, most of us cl have a clay or a clay loam if our clay has been amended and improved. And some of us have silt loam. These are the soil types that are more suitable for dry farming because they naturally have high water holding capacity. We have a limited time today because this is just a quick introduction to dry farming. But if you're interested in knowing more about gardening in clay soil, there are a couple of references on this, uh, on this slide for you to learn more about it. So the good soil for dry farming needs to be about four feet deep because in order for the dry farm to be successful in supporting vegetable growth, the roots have to go really deep to where the water is. And how do we create 
good soil that will uh, allow the roots to penetrate deep. Well, we need to add organic materials to improve the water retention. And this has been shown to work in regenerative farms where farmers practice regenerative agriculture by repeatedly growing cover crop, adding other organic inputs such as manure into the soil year after year after year. And um, it, it is a long-term proposition. The research I've shown usually take close to about 10 years for the soil to have significant increase in organic matter and the depth that would allow for root penetration, but it is doable. And I should clarify why is organic matter an important thing in good soil? Well, when you look at this pie here, you can see healthy soil is supposed to have half of its space available for air and water. And how do we get healthy soil with all of this space in it? The answer is organic matter. Even though they only account for 5% by volume, they are crucial for giving good soil the structure that has space and keeping that space intact. So when we work soil by compacting it or disturbing it, we are taking that space away. We're crushing the space and therefore reducing the air content and the water holding capacity in the soil. In our gardens, we can add organic material such as leaves, uh, manure, compost, we can also grow cover crops here, a couple of examples. And if you grow something like a daikon radish, it has the added benefit of making deep channels in the soil, therefore making your soil have better structure just by virtue of the way they grow. You can achieve a similar effect in the garden by using spading fork or um, broad fork, something like this. And um, I should mention in no-till um, farming, there is the equivalent of something like the broad fork that's attached to a machinery, which would allow the farmer to make deep vertical channels in the, the gardens, in the farm soil without having too much disturbance uh, and destroy the, the soil till. Planting time and techniques in dry farming is quite different from uh, what we know. So the time is based on when the soil is warm enough to for seed germination, but still has the highest amount of soil moisture. And I understand this is not so much of a science, but an art. So you're kind of guessing and um, uh, trying to figure it out. And the depth of the seed planted is based on where there is soil moisture, because obviously we want to put seed where there is moisture to germinate. And often it's planted deeper than what your seed packet would tell you. The density in dry farming is far less compared to an irrigated environment. Generally, it's 50% less. Um, and the planting practice, the most important thing is, in addition to perhaps soaking to give them a, a head start, is to make sure there is good seed to soil contact. So this photo here showing a two by four, um, it's a good tool after you plant the seeds into the furrow and bring the soil over to fill it. You just put the two by four over it and simply press on it a little bit to make sure that there is good contact for seed germination. After the planting, the most important thing is practices to retain soil moisture. And we've talked about using mulch 
to keep moisture in, you can use organic mulch or inorganic mulch. And if you do use organic mulch, just keep in mind, they can cool the soil. So if you don't want germination to be even slower because the soil is cooler, you want to add organic mulch after the seed um, has germinated and the seedling is beginning to grow. Weed management is paramount in the dry farm. The dry farmers think of weed as, uh, or every weed as a straw sucking out water from the soil and competing with the, with the crop. And in addition, in dry farming, the um, monitoring of crusting and cracks in soil is very vigilant. And when that happens, the farmer will practice shallow cultivation to get rid of them because they uh, supposedly help or speed up the water evaporation. So what does dry farming mean in terms of the lessons from there in our home vegetable garden? Well, if you want to conserve water, you could plant earlier, take advantage of high soil moisture, pre-soak the seeds, we've talked about that earlier. Um, you can gain a head start with transplants rather than waiting for seeds to germinate. And we talked about ideas for season extender to protect the seeds and transplant and to help warm up uh, the conditions around them to speed up their development. Another possibility is for us to delay irrigation. In, uh, in the dry farming community, the dry farmer is spending a lot of energy checking soil moisture. Um, and we can do the same thing. We can check soil moisture in order to determine when to begin irrigation. Something else you might think about is irrigate during the critical periods of crop development rather than watering evenly throughout the life cycle of the vegetable. And the link above that's called critical periods of water needs with the link from uh, UMass is a just one source that shows the critical periods. So take that into consideration. In addition, we can plant denser. This is the opposite of dry farming, where, thing, where the crops are planted much more sparsely in order to minimize the competition for available water in the soil. But in our gardens, if we plant denser, we can grow a canopy of shade, which will shade our soil to keep it from warming up, minimize the evaporation or the loss of water, and also to shade out the weeds. And um, we can also use crops that are suitable for dry farming, uh, give a try to growing zucchini or tomato, some dry beans, and vine crops are all potential candidates which will need less water in order to do fine. And finally, some ideas about watering, direct the water to the root zone to minimize loss, water early in the morning to minimize evaporation, be diligent with weed removal because they compete for water, and finally take care of our, take care of our soil by using cover crop, minimizing disturbance, and keep the soil covered. So all of these are just some ideas that may work for the home garden. And now, Cheryl, what questions do we have? Well, I have a question for you right away. One of the viewers is wondering, um, she knows not to till vigorously in her soil, and she's read a lot about cover crops and manure, but she's just not sure how to, to deeply till her soil without ruining <laughs> the soil structure. I know, it sounds kind of conflicting, <laughs> doesn't it? So I'll tell you what um, regenerative farmers do. What they do now is they cut their cover crop and just lay it on top. It is not tilled in. 
anymore. Oh, that's important to know. Okay. And so what they planned, they just, you, the, the farm machines have changed so much. You know, in the old days, planting, I think you have to, you know, stir things up in order to plant. Now it's just like a little precision thing, you know, a little hole and the seed goes in and that's it. So, and, and I think most of us have done this, you know, we've added stuff in the garden bed and then we plant a seed and kind of, you know, let it come up and things smush the, the uh, mulch or anything else that we put on the soil. So I showed a couple of pictures of the broth fork mm -hmm. and the spading fork. Those are soil working tools that make vertical channels in the soil. So we need to think that we're facilitating by adding the vertical channels in the soil, the mixing of things vertically, because always there is better, more organic materials toward the top of the soil. And then when you go down vertically, there's less and less and less. If we create those vertical channels, we're speeding up the mixing. And we and by minimizing disturbing the soil, we are giving the soil microbes and earthworms and other critters an opportunity to be our partner and make that soil good on our behalf. Good answer. Priscilla, next question for you. Um, the very, one of the very first questions we got was, we, I hope you will tell me a recommendation for fertilizers I should use on my cool winter vegetables when I plant them. Or should I just use lime? That was the other part of the question. Uh, Priscilla, can't we can't hear you. Oh, oh. <laughs> there we go. How's that? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, so as I said earlier, a uh, lime is an amendment that we add to the soil when we want to adjust the pH. So that's what you want to do first. Then um, an all-purpose fertilizer is good to, a solid fertilizer is good to put in with your crops. But one thing that I like to do, especially if I'm using transplants, is I'll make a half um, strength liquid fertilizer and submerge my transplants in that liquid fertilizer and watch the bubbles come up so that we know that absolutely every little root hair has been exposed to a little snack so that when it gets into the ground, it is gonna be able to, to grow and develop. So that's the short answer. Okay, that's a good one. Jane. Okay, one, one attendee has said, now our weather has been so wonky. Can I really trust the chart the planting chart for dates, or should I make an adjustment? <laughs> yeah, I would definitely trust the soil temperature and your soil moisture. Do the do the soil squeeze test to find out how if your soil is dry enough, and then definitely get a soil thermometer. Um, it very like you said, our weather lately it's varied too much. I would definitely trust the soil temperature and not the charts as much. But it does give you an idea, you know, that that gives you an idea of whether it's a cool season crop, whether it says you can plant it in March or April, or whether you have to wait until June or July to plant a crop. So that kind of gives you an idea. Yeah, I thought that myself. I thought, yeah, you know what, they, she makes a good point, given that it snowed this morning. So it was... <laughs> <laughs> Um, Priscilla, at the Grow an Extra Row, I know you put black plastic over the, the beds. Do you have problems with ants and other pests that overwinter there? We have found an assortment of pests underneath the, the black plastic from little nests of rodents, um, and we just physically remove them. Um, as far as ants, ants have not been a problem of um, something that we readily see when we when we lift the black plastic. So, um, I there's a there's a variety of ways to abate those those ants, but you know sometimes just disturbing them and you know you can live here, but you just need to live somewhere else. Um, mm -hmm. You know is is a good option. It does make a nice winter time place to be for those insects. And so I can see why they're there, but you're right. If you remove the plastic for a period of time, they may choose to relocate. Yes. And, um, you know, on the other one, the other question, my husband insisted on planting 
his two new little artichoke plants on Monday when we had some nice weather. Oh. <laughs> so as far as wonky weather is, you just kind of need to be prepared. I put a, a small little row cover over just those plants, just in case. And this morning when it was snowing, he was saying, ah, that was a good idea. So, you know, don't let the wonky weather stop. You just be careful. Adjust. Mm -hmm. Adjust. Yeah. Sherry, this okay. one's for you. Um, it has to do with adding worms for aeration purposes in the soil. Do you recommend that? So about three people wanted to know if they added worms to their raised beds or their soil, if that would improve aeration. Well, um, I'm guessing they're thinking about the red wigglers that you can oh. purchase easily. And um, I generally rely on worms that are already in the soil. I'm generally careful with something that is not intended to be there that we introduce, especially if the population goes crazy and out of balance, there may be unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. So I think when it comes to soil, we need to use an approach of first do no harm. And really the tilling and the digging and turning soil over, all the old things that we used to do is a source of harm. And if we can learn to kind of control ourselves, seeing how we look at soil. And then the second thing is we really need to become more patient. Get away from the mentality of instant gratification because with the soil, that just doesn't happen. It takes time and it's important for us to have some humility and allow nature to be a friend with us. So, um, that's an excellent you know, point. I would say create, add organic matter because organic matter feed the soil microbes. And if you do that, you are, you are increasing the, the microbe population ex exponentially. And if we are able to do that, then we have enlisted help from these mighty, you know, armies in the soil to do good for us and then just stay off don't walk on it, don't put weight on it, you know, don't do anything to compact it, grow stuff year round um, to keep the soil covered. Um, that's, that's the key. Great answer. Jane, do you recommend using seed tape for all the cool vegetable seeds, the, thing, the cool vegetables that need to be planted by seed, do seed tapes work best? See, I don't know if they work best or not. I'm mean, either way, but there's no problem with using seed tapes, making your own or purchasing the kind that you put the seeds onto. Yeah, they do work really well. I have, have to, any either of you use the seed tapes. I personally just plant straight my seeds straight into the ground, even my small ones like my carrots. Priscilla or Sherry or Cheryl, have you used the seed tape before? Well, Priscilla is the queen of seed tape. Yeah, she is the queen of seed tape. <laughs> but, but I do have to say, I've used seed tape too. It was like a miracle because I, it's just so hard for me. I, I must be handicapped in this way. It is hard for me to get the seeds and I don't like thinning. So seed tape is the way to go. <laughs> yeah, you know, that. I think the thing with seed tape is, you know, when you look at this weather now, would you rather you know, uh, crouched over the ground that's wet and nasty out there and dirty and carefully place your seeds? Or would you rather sit at the kitchen counter and make the seed tape and then go out there and just lay it in the ground? I mean, really, this is, especially with the small seeds, you know, something like basil, oh my gosh, or lettuce, yeah. it's just a pain to have and to space them just right. So, car carrots, you know, yeah. Yeah, be kind to yourself. Use seed tape. Okay, yeah. here's, here's grow a row, yeah, grow an extra row. We grow um, 50 feet of turnips. So imagine trying to plant the, the turnip seeds, which are, you know, smaller than anything. So yeah, seed tape is the way to go. This question is a good one. And um, I will start with Priscilla and see if everybody else join in if you need to. Um, organic, this, uh, the, these two attendees wrote in and said they don't want any kind of oil-based product as a cover for the soil. So no black plastic being a petroleum type product. What else do you have for an alternative for them? What would you recommend? So I'm assuming they don't want to put the black plastic on over the yeah. winter. So right. I would say a cover crop is a very good um, organic option for them and um, is going to achieve, you know, good soil composition and um, 
The only thing it's not going to do is keep out the extra moisture. And so therefore, as you know, um, we said earlier, Sherry says, you know, you have to have a balance and patience. So that would be mine. There are a lot of good um, organic mulch options that you can uh, use. So yeah, you can use newspaper, cardboard. I mean, you can use a lot of things to cover the soil. You can use banana leaves, you know, just, I mean, just any big thing that is not going to break down too quickly to cover the soil. That's, um, you know, of, of your liking. And if you are going for organic, um, you will want to be aware how um, those things may have been treated with other chemicals. So you want to keep those out of your garden. Yeah, co coffee sacks, exactly. coffee sacks may be a, a possibility for some people, so. Agreed. Um, Jane, a recommendation on a, a cool crop that will do a little shade. A neighbor has a tree and um, she just doesn't know what to plant there that will tolerate more shade. Right, your lettuces and your greens, those can tolerate more shade than some of the others. Uh, your root crops, they do better. They, they can also tolerate a little bit of shade. And the nice thing about the cool season crops are, e even all of them, we don't have as much um, sunshine, as hard sunshine as we do in the middle of summertime. So they are, they're not getting as much anyway. So it, they can all take just a little bit more shade. Yeah, I think I think growing the greens in the shaded environment actually will probably keep it from bolting sooner. Right. So there is a benefit. Right. And a lot of times in the middle, if you do have those cool season crops and it gets really hot, you put something shade over them, an umbrella or something else to shade them so that they don't bolt so much and so they don't burn up and not, if you're getting a really hot day. Very good, Sherry. Yeah. Okay, last question now. Now that we raised the issue of seed tapes, people want to know what's the best uh, paper towels, toilet tissue. Uh, how and somebody else said how you to make seed tape, and I know there are videos out there available to show you how to make seed tape. But what is your experience, Priscilla? All right, so <laughs> uh, I use toilet paper, and I, however long my counter is, I roll out that much toilet paper, cut it in half, and then I separate it so that it is single ply, fold it, and then you place a dot of a water soluble glue. Some people also use a flour paste at Grow an Extra Row. We did a little trial and Elmer's, whoops, water soluble glue was, <laughs> um, was good uh, and did better than the flour in the the, that sort of paste. So you just put down your glue, uh, maybe about five or six dots, have your ruler out because you really wanna make sure that you're spacing those seeds at the proper distance. It's amazing how you might get closer and closer or farther and farther apart. So you have your rulers you. out. And if any of you have ever seen one of my other presentations, my granddaughter who's three years old, loves to make seed tape because it's incorporating all of those fun things. But anyway, get your seeds on. And then you just, um, I put a few taps of glue on the outside edge so that I get a nice seal. But then I also just press on each seed and um, comes out really great. Protect your work surface because you will get a little bit of bleeding through of the, uh, the glue onto your, onto your surface. So wherever you're working, you want to Perfect. I can feel everybody headed out to make seed tape. <laughs> and and the seeds, you know, the seed tape that's offered commercially just is so limited. If you really want to do some of those wonderful turnips or, you know, uh, lettuces, you you want to you want to buy your seeds and then make your own tape. That's perfect. And you know what? That was our last question. You guys did great. Lots of information there. Next up is mason bees. Am I right? Next week, Mason Bees? Yep, that's right. Okay. Yeah, I think there are uh, some of the males are trying to come out, but it's just too early. And oh, so, so cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. See you next week.